tú eres dueño de, 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 dueño de la empresa. Muy buenos días a todos. Hello everyone. Welcome to one of the very last sessions or roundtables we're going to be having in the Third World Conference on Higher Education. For us, it is an honor to be able to share with you real experiences on how artificial intelligence impacts higher education and, of course, how higher education impacts AI. I'm Kulti Mansodia. I am in charge of capacity development at the International Institute for UNESCO in Latin America and the Caribbean. And here in this session, I will have five major panelists who will be showing us practical cases of how artificial intelligence is being implemented in institutions of higher learning. I'd also like to welcome those who are with us virtually today. We have with us different people around, from around the world. Among those, we have, of course, the honor to be with two major panelists to whom I shall also be giving the floor. This session will be happening in simultaneous, with simultaneous interpretation in English, French, and Spanish. In spite of the pandemic we have experienced, we can say that COVID has also greatly accelerated change in the educational ecosystem. And we've seen that around the world, in very short space of time, necessary skills and digital technology have taken on a very important role. Everyone who is involved in the university ecosystem, such as our students, our teachers, and of course, the administrative staff and researchers absolutely need to have much in greater in-depth knowledge to have answers to their questions and solutions to their problems. This is one of the things that has been identified in this health emergency situation. So along those lines, if we want to guarantee a digital future, which is safe and inclusive for everyone, as declared by the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, we need to have artificial intelligence become a public good. And this is why the use of education, of artificial intelligence in higher education has to be aligned on UNESCO's fundamental values, including inclusion and equity. Since the adoption by, of the Beijing Consensus in 2019 up until the re adoption of recommendations on ethics and artificial intelligence at UNESCO last year, we have been committed to research and giving incentives and support to the application of artificial intelligence in education, and of course, including higher education. Following this commitment, we have been researching on and supporting the implementation of this. UNESCO IESEC has worked on a series of materials and reports which are meant to provide practical guidelines for different stakeholders when they are implementing artificial intelligence in the context of higher education. So we have now produced a manual which promotes different concepts which exist concerning AI and showing how it may be applied to have practices and managers of education and teaching more effective. If we could do this on the basis of uh, implementation in higher education, we can base ourselves on three main pillars, learning, then management administration of institutions of higher learning, and then finally everything to do with research. We are also about to publish another report on AI and higher education, linking it to the strategic development goals, where we reflected on 36 practical cases which contribute to AI on the basis of concrete experience of higher learning institutions. And this roundtable has representatives of different parts of the academic world, the private and public sectors, civil society, and of course, 
the international community. And the goal here is to have a conversation on the relations which exist between AI and higher teaching on two different levels. First of all, to see what AI has to offer to higher education and how teaching and learning in administration and management in research can be assisted or supported by AI. And then also to see what can be done for and with AI to have a more fair and equitable form of teaching that will also be more directed toward the SDGs. So from this viewpoint, I would like to welcome, first of all, Mr. Miao, who will be telling us some things about his direct experience with initiatives being carried out concerning AI and UNESCO. Mr. Miao, you are welcome to introduce your presentation. Uh, the dear uh, moderator, my colleague uh, Yuma, uh, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, dear participants, uh, well, good morning from UNESCO. Uh, I am honored to be here to share uh, what UNESCO is doing in the field of artificial intelligence and education, also to share my personal view uh, on the topic, especially about uh, the use of AI in higher education. Basically, I will introduce uh, very quickly what UNESCO is doing in the field of uh, AI and education. And I will share some more details about our latest uh, publication on artificial intelligence and education guidance for policymakers. And uh, I will use uh, a couple of slides to share my views on the digitalization and the digital transformation of education uh, to talk about the way forward. Uh, from UNESCO, we are not only supporting uh, member states' work in the field of artificial intelligence, we very much position the use of artificial intelligence in the overall picture of digital learning, and in the past we call it uh, uh, ICT in education, especially when we are supporting the planning and the implementation of the national ICT education policy. We have been producing a, a set of uh, integrated uh, UNESCO portfolio to support the national ICT education policy, currently under the title of digital learning policy. Uh, as uh, international standard setters in the education area, we are developing international standard setting instruments relating to ICT education, uh, AI, and uh, open educational resources. For example, for overall ICT education policy, we had the Qingdao Declaration for OER. We, ha we have the recommendation on OER uh, that was released in 2019. And also in 2019, we released the Beijing Consensus on Artificial Intelligence and AI. And also as the capacity builder, we are supporting countries in developing the national ICT education policy. We have support more than 60 countries directly in developing their national ICT education policy and must plan. And all this policy and must plan have been endorsed and being implemented. And we, as a kind of uh, laboratory of ideas, we're also producing intellectual guidelines and the guidance on all this, uh, this topic. We are the only one UN agency that have developed the uh, policy guidelines or guidance on uh, sector-wide ICT education policy, OER policy, and AI and education policy. Actually, we will publish very soon, hopefully within one, one month, a guide on the use of blockchain in education. Uh, very, very likely we will move into the area of the use of uh, metaverse in education. Uh, once again, we are the only one UN agency that have producing four guidelines, uh, uh, general ICD education, OER, AI, and the, metaverse, uh, and the blockchain. And of course, as the catalyst of international cooperation, we have been organized international conference on all these three topics. For example, for OER, we organized two congresses. Uh, in 2012 and 2017 uh, separately. And we have been organized nine years Mobile Learning Week. Uh, it's a flagship uh, event in the UN agency uh, about digital learning. This is the longest uh, you know, uh, annual meeting we have organized and uh, the whole UN has organized on digital learning. And on AI and education, uh, from 2019, we have continuously organized the annual conference or international forum on AI and education. 
And uh, th those are the three publications I mentioned we already published uh, for the AI and education we published the last year. Now it's available in seven languages, six EU language plus Korean language. And uh, for the guidelines for ICT education policy and master plan, we published uh, this January or February. And we are making it available in six EU language. This one was published in 2019. Now it's available in English, French, including Spanish. And this uh, the one picture we can uh, outline what UNESCO is doing in the field of uh, artificial intelligence and education. Over the years, as I mentioned, we are organizing annual meeting on AI and uh, education starting from 2019. We finished last year in December 2021. We are planning for this year. And uh, cross-cutting this, we have key areas. We are fostering AI-ready policymakers through the uh, instruments, Beijing Consensus, and we publish the guidance for policymakers. Now we are organizing workshops to supporting the policymaker. We organized one regional seminar for the Gulf states in Arabic region, and the last month we organized another one on artificial intelligence and, and education policies in Latin America and the Caribbean region. And uh, we are also uh, based on uh, UNESCO's recommendation on ethics of AI. We are developing an ethical principle on the use of AI in education, uh, particularly. And we think that it's very important to develop the AI competency. So we are developing a guiding framework on AI competency. And we already uh, completed a mapping of the AI curriculum for schools, for K-12 schools. We published the report this year, I think around two months ago. And then we are now developing a report on AI and the futures of learning. And we are carrying out activity to uh, elicit sub, uh, opinions from experts and from other key holders like uh, youth teachers. And, and then we will synthesize a report on AI and the futures of learning. I think this is very, very relevant to the audience of today of the World High Education Conference. We need to think how we can promote open algorithms and also open source AI tools for public good. It's very much the responsibility of the higher education institutions. You must think of this. And uh, these are the list of the key publications uh, that I mentioned. We have the Beijing Consensus available in six EU languages, including Spanish. And we have the AI and the education uh, guidance for policymakers available in uh, UN language and the Korean. And uh, then we have the, published this report, uh, Key to 12 Curriculum and Mapping of Government Induced AI Curriculum. We are also translating this report into other languages. And uh, through to um, call for innovation, we collected more than 80 best practices on AI and education published to compendium. I think probably we are the, also the, the UN agency that have collected the most number of uh, best practices, very critical and uh, concrete and specific AI education practice and solutions. And we also have the UNESCO Prize for ICT education. Uh, we uh, put uh, the theme relating to AI for two years. And every year we have two laureates. Now we have four laureates uh, that win the prize in the topic of AI education. One of them is from Spain. Another Spanish-speaking country is Brazil, win the prize. And uh, here is the, the, the structure of the AI and education guidance for policymakers. Basically, there are four parts. The first one is that we, we think that this area is very new and it's quite difficult for policymakers, especially educational policymakers, to understand the knowledge of AI. So we try to summarize some AI essentials for policymakers, uh, including not only the AI technique, AI technology, but also uh, a kind of analysis about the potentials and also limitations of AI. For example, what do you mean by weak AI? What do you mean by strong AI? What could be the uh, emergent AI in the near future? And from a perspective of AI, uh, uh, human AI collaboration, sometimes we call it a human machine collaboration. And then we try to summarize what are the key areas of using AI in education and what are the key emerging practices, including the intellectual tutorial system, but also the learning management system, also the use of AI for assessment, for empowering teachers, and also for the so-called personalized learning. So, and we analyze the benefits and the risks in this emerging practice. And more specifically, we talk about the challenge 
of leveraging AI to achieve SDG for Education 2030, uh, not only about the digital divide, but also the ethical challenge, and all more importantly, how we ensure teacher, uh, teacher agency and student agency when we are introducing AI into the classroom and in other learning settings. And um, very, very specifically, we collected and reviewed the existing AI and education policies. And we put forth a kind of review. And based on that, we uh, introduced a set of policy recommendations on the use of AI education. We hope that, you know, especially for the higher education participants, you need to think, what do we mean by digital humanism? And how AI and technology will change humanity, not only the behaviors, not only education, uh, in the long run, how technology, digital technology will change us ch as a humanity. Uh, you as a higher education researchers, you must think of this uh, together with us. And we put forth uh, four very fundamental key policy questions also for the higher education policy makers and uh, institutional leaders of universities and higher education institutions. You must ask yourself, we ask ourselves these four questions. How can we ensure the ethical and equitable use of AI in education before we introduce AI in the privileged populations that are already in the campus of a university? How about the people are outside of the campus of a university? And even many of them are abandoned from the campus, for example, for the refugees. When they are moving from Syria to the European country, they are not alone to enter the campus of a university. How about their use of artificial intelligence? We need to think of the equitable, equitable use and inclusive use of AI. And then how AI can be used to deliver the unfulfilled promise of the education for all, EFA goes before 2015. Many, many of the targets we have not reached, reached yet. How can we use AI to deliver them? And how AI can enable the learning and of the future and also with the digital humanism we want for the future. But if possible, uh, what are the AI literacy and, and AI skills needed for human machine collaboration, but also for the econ economic development? So we believe all the policy, AI and education policy should have these components. Uh, no country can avoid this, uh, which means that we should set up a vision that uh, we move towards digital humanism when we are using AI in education. And we need to set up a kind of a cornerstone for any country that we need to develop the AI competency for the current generation, more importantly, for the next generations. And uh, even more important than this is that the government has a, has an urgent need to develop regulations to govern and regulate the use of AI in education because all of our citizens are being used by AI. Even they are not using AI, they are being used by AI, they are being regulated by AI, they are being uh, manipulated by AI. And to, to uh, protect all the citizens, any government need to urgently develop a regulatory framework to govern the use of AI, to govern the design of AI. We call it throughout the AI uh, system life cycle, from the design to the apl application, to the monitoring, to the evaluation, and even to the, to the uh, the feeding out how we should collect the e waste, uh, uh, you know, generated by AI, and then uh, for the purpose of use of AI in education, as I said, it, we should consider how we can use AI as a common good to deliver the unfulfilled promise in education, and then look forward how AI can be used as a public good to support the pedagogical innovation needed by the future. And um, in terms of the regulations, uh, a little bit of detail, uh, UNESCO adopted a recommendation on ethics of AI on 23rd November 2021. And actually, there's a definition about the ethics of AI uh, that is referring to AI-based uh, prediction and decision making and uh, the impact of this prediction and decision making on our behavior and on the society and even for the on the environment and the ecosystems based on this we need to consider when we are introduce ai in the classroom including higher education uh, we need to move from the data worship to the data justice and think how we we can protect the data ownership data sovereignty and also the data privacy and we need to surface the algorithm discrimination not only for gender but also 
when we are using uh, you know ai for the psychometric prediction we need also concern about the ethical issue and the regulate the, the the introduction of the intrusive ai power the tools for example the head ring that will st stimulate the students if they are not paying attention to the lectures shall we use this we need to really really develop regulations of course fundamentally we need to think even for the higher education lectures professors we need to protect the human teachers agency and the student agency when we are using AI. And we must uh, be mindful that there's a lot of uncharted ethical issues. We need to uh, review them and uh, regulate them. Uh, I put forth uh, uh, this uh, analytical framework on the ethics of AI. Basically, I'm using two dimensions plus one. The first one is the technology dimension, which means the AI system life cycle. Uh, for, uh, including the production and the store of data, access to and the control of the data, and uh, the data and the algorithm based the decision making and the human AI interface. From these uh, key steps and of the AI life cycle and uh, their interaction with the human's behavior, starting from individual human, but also some group uh, human uh, uh, composing of uh, society. But more importantly, we have a very special existence of a human, and that is the sovereign states. They have its law, its regulation, and very often we find that the use of AI will, will hit the wall of the states because they have the regulations. And of course, we need to consider, we are, in, we are living in the environment, we are living in the <laughs> ecosystem. Any use of AI will have impact on the uh, environment ecosystem, so we need to put the ethics and uh, biocentrism view, not only human centrism view, but we need to think we are in a bi biological <laughs> cycle. And of course, we need to think of the human historical dimension because uh, AI is developing very rapidly, it's changing almost every day. So if we use this, uh, this framework, you will find that all the AI issues, you can posi position them and analyze them. Actually, I published one paper on this, but it's not the time to talk about the detail. But we need to think, what's our analytical framework on the SKS for AI, and then to understand them, and then to find the best way to regulate them. And uh, in terms of AI as a common good to deliver on fulfilled promise, we should very much move from the slogans to uh, uh, analysis and to actions. So for this purpose from UNESCO, we try to think deeper about what are the fundamental issues uh, uh, you know, we can use AI as a common good to address. For example, the access to education, uh, how, including the language barrier, but also the disability uh, barrier, and how we can use AI to address them. Actually, AI has very, very special potential to address this challenge. And how we can use AI to diagnose learning disability, not only the physical disability, and how we can use AI to monitor learning problems and the learning failure, and to even to alert the education dropout. But we believe, and there are many, many more fundamental challenge we need to define, and then we need to explore how we can use AI to address them. And we collect, as I said, a lot of good examples and AI solutions to address this issue and including how to you know, looking forward how we can use ai to monitor learning outcome and drop out we have one prize winner of unesco's prize that is from finland covila is very potential and then uh, looking forward for about the, the use of ai to enable the future of learning we must acknowledge that the current ai algorithm is not as uh, said by the commercial providers that they said ai is transforming learning pedagogy pedagogical methodology is completely wrong uh, actually ai is downgrading the the uh, learning methodology because uh, we believe that uh, uh, the teaching and the learning should move from the knowledge uh, you know the memorization of factual knowledge but actually the current uh, ai algorithm uh, is reinforced the memorization of factual knowledge is not moving towards open and uh, student-centered pedagogy. So I have this analysis. You know, this is the AI technology we introduced in the AI and education uh, guidance for policymakers. We need to ensure the transparency and explain, uh, explainability of the AI tools, and we need to think the trade-off of using AI, whether to use AI or not. 
And if we use, we use AI, what are the best AI solutions? And then ensure that AI will do no harm to students. And then we analyze the fundamental issue of, uh, of education, uh, for teaching and learning, including how we can use AI to enable inclusive access, moving from the low skill task unit, and for example, moving from uh, uh, addressing the hearing and the visual issue, but really, really to think of the personalized assistant, a lifelong learning assistant to use AI to enable that, and uh, then to avoid uh, objecting by uh, the human learners. And for, for the teaching, for the learning, move from the low skill teaching, for example, to, uh, to facilitate the memorization, the content profiling, uh, to uh, inspire innovative pedagogy. So far, no algorithm doing that. And we also need to protect teachers agency. But and moving from the content profiling to the personalized outcome to enable open learning spaces. Now it's, it's the opposite because the algorithm is creating a kind of uh, content cocoon, which means they recommend the content the algorithm believe the student are interested in. Actually, it may not be the student that are interested. Even they are interested, we should not confine the student with their content cocoon. cocoon. Rather, we should open the learning space. And then for the use of AI for assessment, we should move from the use of AI uh, for the uh, readings, for the low skill uh, kind of assessment uh, tasks to assess the learning problem, as I said, and to monitor the failures and the drop out. Of course, we need to avoid uh, the, the, you know, the, the algorithm bias. And then for the administration and the management, we also need to move from the chatbot. The use of chatbot is good, but we need to move from the use of chatbot for very low skill administrative tasks. For example, pro the, the schedule of the, uh, the, the study program and the name of the professors, the subject, uh, you know, the, the main subject, move from this to a data informed uh, education management information system. Of course, we should avoid that we seed to machine to account for, uh, accountable uh, for the decision making. We should always hold the, the human as a, for, for, to be accountable for the decision making. And also we should avoid the large scale use of AI for surveillance of student and teacher's behavior. Based on that, the last topic is how we can define AI competency. The AI competency should be composed of three components, humanistic value, AI literacy, a basic skill, and the advanced AI skills for the economic development. For this purpose, and we, for the K-12 AI curriculum, we did a mapping last year. We circulated a survey to 90, 193 member states, and we collected the data. We published this report. And we map out that uh, uh, globally, only 11 countries have developed and induced K-12 AI curriculum, not include the uh, span. And uh, four countries are having the AI curriculum in development. Again, uh, no more uh, span. And uh, we have Portuguese. And uh, uh, how about the AI curriculum in higher education institution? Can you do this uh, as well? I know it's more complex in terms of AI curriculum in higher education, but uh, probably you could consider. And we define, we try to define AI literacy and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the learning outcome of AI for K-12. That's our define of the learning outcome, three key category and the nine uh, subcategory. We, I will not have the time to go to the detail. And even we mapping the, the time allocated to different uh, uh, categories. And uh, so I will not go to the detail uh, either. And then we have the concrete definition about each of the nine subcategories. This is one of the example. And uh, other than we think that we need to prepare teachers for this, including that teachers should have AI literacy, but also they need to have the knowledge about the domain specific AI that adopted in their learning settings. But uh, the teacher also need to learn how to make data informed decision making about their teaching methodology. And uh, we put forth these key findings and the recommendation. Uh, among others, I want to, we want to highlight that you know the AI tools must be an uh, agnostic approach to the AI branding and the AI technology. Before I conclude my uh, slides, I want to share my views about the digitalization and the digital transformation of education. Actually, we need to think uh, historically. 
uh, 40 years ago, we tried to digitize information. It's not digitalization. For example, you rem we remember that we scanned the, pa the paper textbook into PDF. For 30 years ago, we call it a digital textbook. Now the digital textbook, nobody will call the scanning of a paper textbook a digital textbook. Now we make a digitalization of the textbook, meaning that we digitalize not only the one piece or several pieces of information, but the procedure and the business model, for example. We have the interactive multimedia textbook. And then now we are talking about digital, digital transformation. Digital transformation is very different from digital learning. We must think how we can use uh, digital technology to upgrade the business model, to adopt the, the new business model. One analog, this one will refer to, for example, how we can train the traditional taxi driver to use technology within their car, taxi car, vehicles, within the cars, how they can use technology to have a GPS, to have a, uh, you know, Google map, and how to maybe to call and respond to customers. And, but not thinking of how we can upgrade the whole taxi industry. This one is used the rubber, to completely change the business model of the taxi industry. If we want to digital, have a digital transformation of education, we must think in this way. And I think that how we can move from instrumental rationality to a value rationality to promote humanistic vision and humanistic needs and then to mobilize the whole society's resources and to have intersectoral co-governance of the use of digital learning. But we also need to think that this kind of balance between human needs and also the needs of the government and also the disruption of the digital private governance. For example, after the pandemic, we may need to think how we can really, really in enhance the resilience of the school system. Not only think of the use of AI in classroom, but how to use AI to change the school system to make the school program more open and accessible ubiquitously at home, but not only at school, but also at home. And uh, we also need to go back to see in each of the historical age, what kind of technology emerged and change, enabled some uh, learning pedagogy. Now we are here. You know, 10 years ago, we talked about the mobile brand and we have mobile learning. Now, after 10 years, we are in a turning point again. New technology are coming. We may have a parallel to um, worse to universe, and we have a parallel to digital space and the physical space. And we may think of the unknown form of learning. You are the professors. I think I just read the question. I don't have an answer. I hope uh, you can share your answer with UNESCO. Uh, it's over. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fischel Miao. Uh, I think that we have all seen the, the value uh, of the common good for, for uh, artificial intelligence as the futures of learning by developing these AI competencies. I may, I may can say that in this sense we can talk also about the importance of enhanced different learning domains, maybe the cognitive domain based on understanding what is artificial intelligence, of course the metacognitive domain by including this ethical level and finally, of course, the behavioral domain, you know, by developing this kind of researches in order to um, measure the impact of artificial intelligence in higher education. Now, uh, we are going to start with the, with the panelists. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Miguel Valle del Olmo. He's already with us. Welcome, Miguel. Miguel, um, I'm going to change in Spanish. Excuse me. Miguel is Subdirector General. Miguel is. AI and Technology Assistant Director at the State Secretariat for Digitalization, AI, of the Spanish government. Thanks a lot, Miguel, for coming here, or attending remotely, rather. We know that you've had other commitments, but we're happy that you're here, albeit virtually. I'll move on to the panel in order to be able to start the dialogue with all of the guest speakers. we will find out about how AI is affecting higher education and secondly, how higher education develops different initiatives 
to promote the development and research of AI. We've got some information here that says that according to a Times Higher Education and Microsoft survey, 79% of leaders in higher education say that AI will be increasingly important in their institutes. But of the, that 79%, only 41% of institutions have a defined strategy on AI in order to strengthen implementation. And of that 41%, only 43% of those institutions have a specific budget to do that. In this first section, what we're going to try to do is focus on these real cases on what AI can do for higher education and how to implement that. I think that's of interest to all of us, that practical side of things, and how to implement AI with a strategy in line with the institution. That's why we have Ms. Marisa Fondon, who is at the Columbia uh, uh, Cooperative University, and she's dean of that and a representative of the Equality Committee. The Colombian University is second in terms of gender equality in Latin America. It's the only university in the region that has that recognition. It also has the Colombian Sustainability Award for good working practices in terms of inclusion and equity. Dr. Ronton won an award from the Foundation of Equity for promoting diversity, inclusion, equality, and entrepreneurship within the Cooperative University of Colombia. So welcome, Ms. Ronton, and thanks for coming today. Thanks very much. Good morning to all of you. We're going to show you a, an image so that Dr. Rondon can explain how the strategy for AI was implemented in an institution with more than 40,000 students. What were the steps that you followed in order to be able to achieve such an important success as the one that you did? Well, thanks a lot. Good morning to all of you. I'm from Colombia, the Cooperative University. We're a multi-campus since system. We're present in 19 cities in the country with some 40,000 students. Our students come from more than 800 municipalities in Colombia. Colombia has about 1,100 municipalities. So our students come from a lot of different cities and municipalities in the country. Our model is that we are a uh, presence-based institution. And because of the pandemic, of course, we had to develop very rapidly in terms of combining uh, modalities. So moving from a face-to-face -face teaching process to one that combined face-to-face -face and remote learning. I'd like to draw your attention for a moment to the graph on the screen. We didn't start with AI. The digital transformation of our university started with transactional systems. Why? Because we had a huge area of opportunity, which was the Dayton government. We had different information systems, but we didn't have any kind of architecture. So the phases that we started to structure were having an information system for the main axis, which is our educational model. We wanted to give privilege to uh, being and education. And we had three very important actors with regard to the opportunities and also the requirements with a coherent structure, the institution, the teacher, and the student. And having resolved that issue of having a transactional information system, and we thought that the uh, this was mature, we moved on to another level, which wasn't just about transaction, but intelligence. So we had systems that enabled us to 
make reports and take decisions, but they weren't predictive, they were corrective. And then what about the insertion of students when they weren't there anymore? So we had to find a way of having a system to accompany us and reach that level of AI in order to be more predictive and find out much more about our people, but also be more efficient when it comes to management, giving more time for thinking, planning, drawing up strategies, and rather than processing data manually. And this is where we saw significant change in Colombian legislation, where we started talking about learning results, and we began to feel a need to have systems to ensure quality and make it possible to monitor learning, teaching, and management. And then, of course, we reached a level of AI in order to close a significant gap in the milestones of our transformation, which was having a, our own digital ecosystem. The difference between a digital ecosystem and a technological ecosystem is that technology is the teams, the cables, all of the tangible elements. However, the digital ecosystem that we have is the people operating our model, that is technology at the service of this model. And after spending a lot of years searching we came up with Juan Pablo and you Plana, and they've been working with us for three years on implementation so that today we have achieved some very interesting results. For example, we manage 85 predictive variables, enabling us to make interventions in the learning process of the students Obviously, we need the teacher to be there. We've got our map of skills in a tool that enables us to identify the evolution of the development of skills of the students. It also enables us to have systems. And I don't want to be pejorative, but we don't present reports in Office, PowerPoint, or Excel, but we use our digital ecosystem to do that with some 93% of level one and two processes, strategic and support processes. All of those are supported by our IT system. And this allows for a strategic level not only in terms of learning results, but also institutional results. The major recommendation or the, the great experience that we've had in this transformation process and this process of incorporating AI, well, I'll give you five points to think about. The first is that when an institution is involved in such change, it's not just a matter of flicking a switch and there you've got the technology. No, it's a process of learning. And the second point, I said this and I'll say this with a great deal of respect to technology providers, you can't just come and offer uh, licenses or machines or cables, but you've got to come and offer solutions to institutions, and that's my second recommendation if the institution as well as the partner are clear about that, you don't buy licenses, you buy solutions. And then we need dialogue, dialogue when it comes to the implementation process. It's not just pay us now, here are the engineers, it's all installed and I'll go. No, 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 there's a very interesting phase of finding out about the identity of the institution and working together. The third recommendation is that leadership is absolutely fundamental. Leadership isn't a bottom-up 
process. It has to be a top down from the leaders down. There will be no good results if there's a group of teachers or ad administrators doing these projects. Well, there could be, but if the leadership comes from the decision makers, then everything will flow much more quickly. People take ownership much more quickly, and early victories can be seen in these change processes. The fourth recommendation is manage change, technology per se. It's not just having it, that's not the final point. It's the use and taking ownership and changing the culture of the organization. And the fifth recommendation, more than a recommendation, it's a comment. When you start with such transformations in an institution, they never end. You're always going to have to have money available year after year because something new is going to crop up. There's going to be obsolescence as well. And so you cannot remain behind. So very briefly, that's my experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor. I think that those five points highlight an essential factor that has to do with the leadership capacity of an institution and also the continuous improvement of the change process. We need to understand that implementing such technologies isn't just about flicking a switch and having everything miraculously done. I wish it were, but it's not. We've got Juan Pablo Mena with us, who's the CEO and co-founder of Uplanner. Uplanner was recognized by the International Institute for Investigation into AI by UNESCO as one of the 100 best companies when it comes to implementing AI. Juan Pablo is also a civil engineer. He's got an MBA, and he's working on AI linked to the tech sector. Uplanner is involved in the development of such AI solutions, and in this regard, We would like to find out about how you, based on this re relationship with the University in Colombia, for example, or a lot of other institutions, because I understand that you've worked with more than 100 institutions in more than 116 countries. So I'd like to know how you've been implementing these solutions. And based on your experience, what are these good practices from a company point of view this time? Well, yes. Thanks very much. Thanks for your introduction. Implementing technology, well, I agree with Dr. Rondon. It's a huge challenge. We need to be clear about the strategy first and foremost. I uh, would also highlight what Dr. Rondon said about leadership. We need to ensure that this permeates through the entire institution, and that helps a great deal because oftentimes institutions have problems because there's no pressure or energy exerted from above telling, telling people where the future lies. It's leadership thinking about five years more or 10 years more or 20 years more and not thinking about uh, the problems that there were just a year ago. You have to focus on, on different problems. We've focused on coverage and how to be more efficient so that institutions accept more students or so that they can grow more to ensure increased coverage there are only 35% of students in the world who have access to higher education, according to UNESCO, so that's a very low figure. And the issue of insertion, that's a huge problem. We worked with the cooperative university along those lines on quality, focusing and ensuring that the student's experience is a high quality one. Those are issues that we're focusing on. And just to summarize what we're doing, it's artificial intelligence, of course, algorithms to resolve these problems. And as Dr. Rondon said, 
we try to establish partnerships with the institutions rather than just being technology providers. We focus on the final results, not just incorporating data. We've always got a window open for innovation, and we learn a great deal from each institution that we work with. So we incorporate all of the innovation in our product, and then with the more than 100 universities working with us, we ensure that they can take advantage of that in the coming weeks. We've worked mainly in four areas, curriculum management, monitoring skills learning, We use algorithms to find out about students and student behavior and uh, student uh, dropout rates. And we're able to manage the situation and be efficient to ensure that students continue at the university and graduate. The student experience, that's something we've been working on lately trying to ensure that students have a really good learning experience. And every time we see a possible risk, we can take immediate measures in order to ensure that the students remain. And we try to ensure that that's automatic. This is extremely complex when we talk about all of this together. We've got 10 products out there for each of these problems. and. There's communication, so the institution can establish its digital strategy using AI to automate the processes where possible and, sh and ensure that students have a greater learning experience. The huge challenge that we have, as Dr. Rondon said, relates to investigation, research, and we're looking for more institutions, universities or institutes that want to work on innovation. We're, t we're working on the whole blockchain issue, passports as well, to ensure that students have skills certificates that enable them to transfer from one university to another or continue their studies later on. or monitor that this has been do being done in the best possible way. We've also been thinking a great deal about what Dr. Miao said, the overall process that's currently required for applied AI to resolve all of the little problems that emerge, but also to look at them all through a strategic point of view. And we're quite enthusiastic about monitoring the institutions as well. We've been seeking ways of increasing the level, looking at best practices in a lot of institutions in terms of uh, university dropout rates, um, competences, skills, and different features that also have to do with accreditation or assessment of the institutions. And we're working on all of these initiatives with the institutions themselves. So it's applied direct innovation to deal with the problem. So that's what we've been doing. This morning, we had a, a meeting with Juan Pablo. And I said that it was very important for us to monitor learning, but also the student at the university and to be able to monitor people throughout their lives, people who come to our institutions. And also, we can recognize the skills that they already have, that they bring with them, but that are registered elsewhere. It's not a, uh, a school report, but no, it's the concept of competence. When it was acquired, uh, when it's no longer applicable, uh, or in force, and when they come back to the university to study. Thank you very much. That whole field of upskilling and reskilling, lifelong learning. 
We've spoken about so many issues, including management and administration of the system, of the entire institution, everything that has to do with the process of learning. We've talked about predictive models and prescriptive models. Those are some important aspects that AI brings. And we've moved on to the field of innovation. What Juan Pablo was saying about creating new research lines to create new products to make it possible to continue to develop in the field of AI. And that's so timely because our next speaker, Andres Pedreño, is the director of the AI Observatory and co-founder uh, of uh, Torre Juana, uh, a space for innovation and development comprising representatives from different technologies, AI, blockchain, big data, IUD, and a number of innovation project, projects come from there, often in partnership with universities. And one of the, and, and you're a, a present, president of One Million Bot. And I'd like to hear from you a little bit about that experience, Andres. You were also dean of the University of Alicante and member of the Committee of Experts of the Spanish government for the white paper on AI and big data. So Andres, how did you manage to generate that innovation ecosystem among universities from an external body? Well, good morning and thank you very much. First and foremost, I'd like to congratulate uh, Juan Pablo and Ms. R uh, Dr. Rondon leadership that's very important, and we would like to be able to work with you. This is a collaborative space, and I think when it comes to technological development, there are intense changes, innovations that have a general impact that change the whole, th the whole field. So our philosophy is always a collaborative one to bring together small startups, small companies specializing in things that they do well, and we try to work with them. So we work together in a historic uh, campus in Alicante, which is protected area, and we work on innovation. We carry out environmental sustainability practices concerning uh, organic farming with AI, and we try to specialize in big data, uh, uh, intelligence, and so on and so forth. So we, we try to specialize in small things. We try to do them really well from an international point of view. And we try to work with hybrid technologies in order to take advantage of those. And on universities, COVID has been really important because it highlighted the importance of digitalization, particularly in all fields. And we were lucky, and I say lucky, to have worked in, in, in Spanish on the whole COVID issue. We've uh, taken part in different tenders, and we've really been, been trained in Spanish, in an Anglo-Saxon technological world. And we've worked with the UN to inform about all of this. And in Ecuador, we identified problems uh, such as uh, food scarcity. And the Ecuadorian government has also helped us to resolve operational problems in that field. In terms of my university career, I have always identified with the application of such tools. I was also the CEO of Univers Universiad for four years and an advisor until very recently. And th this really enabled me to identify a lot of problems 
from uh, an impressive network of universities and then provide solutions to them. The one million bot solution, which is applied in some 30 universities in Spain as well as elsewhere, is based on natural language process. First of all, a, a way of breaking down barriers between a bot and students is that a student can turn to a bot almost as if it were a person, but obviously it's not, and, and the bot will understand them. That was really a, an exciting experience. At the beginning, we realized that when students uh, interacted with a bot or insulted the bot or uh, had a discussion, well, there was some apprehension, but some ITs said that bots don't need to inform about everything. So we needed to achieve empathy. If the bot was insulted, they had to put the student in their place. But if it was a joke, well, the bot had to be able to understand the joke. And in that language, uh, it was necessary to understand the difference between idiot and plonker, for example. So we needed language empathy to break down a cultural barrier. And then at Spanish universities, we saw there was a problem, which was that when the freshers first started at university, there were students who came from different social classes, different regions, and so on. Some came with their parents. Some had a vocational problem, but the university couldn't deal with 4,000 or 5,000 new students in four or five days. And that's where our bots came in. They were trained to identify uh, all of the different uh, professions and uh, university degrees and grades given and uh, for all of these students. So it was an, admi an, an administrative process. The universities were overwhelmed with work and with some 500 frequently asked questions and data regarding problems, queries, concerns that the students had and the university managers weren't able to identify well. And it was so important to, to respond simultaneously in a few days to resolve this administrative issue about queries and so on. Often students are led to uh, study something because of a series that they've been watching for years on TV. And that's led them to, to want to study the same thing. It, it's a, seri a serious issue because sometimes they don't like the subject they're actually studying. And it was necessary to resolve problems such as that. So that's the first phase. We've got this system in some 30 universities. It's been published in the Harvard Review, for example. And uh, it's been working for some four years in almost all universities in Madrid. And there's about a 98% language identification success rate. Uh, there are questions that bots are asked that not even humans would understand. But sometimes the questions, or often the questions, can be understood, and the bots are, are a help. And what about the workers who now have a lot more time free? They deal with people who've got emotional issues, people who have who come in crying because they can't understand or study. So, so the, the people can devote more time to those people and their emotional issues rather than the administrative issues. So the bots have, have assisted. And that's the first point, not only when it comes to uh, registering, but also there are other services. And during the pandemic as well, advice um, provided, there was a 
24 hour, seven days a week uh, advice, such as uh, for people who'd forgotten a password, didn't know how to install software, and this was uh, used as a model to plan other services. And I think it's important that universities uh, automate where possible to leave time for management elsewhere. This creates a culture of efficiency, good use of resources. I think that's extremely important. So that first stage is a stage that we're resolving pretty well. We're showing some leadership here. And we're very proud and very satisfied with what we're doing. Our second subject. <coughs> which gives, I think, a lot of advantages, is what's happening in Spain now with the idea that when you have one out of three university students leaves the university, and that makes, them, of course, things easier to plan in some ways, but we need to talk also much more about uh, digital matters in these contexts. If we have a look at what's going on in virtual campuses where we see patterns that show us very clearly that uh, over and above the first indicators that we already had, that there is a great risk of dropping out and the tools need to be elaborated to show mechanisms to get people back into school. I think this is fairly complementary to what we've been saying before and I'd be very happy to know much more about this and see how you all are dealing with these matters. A third point has a lot to do I think with my own student days and a concern that I had. I was a very bad student I have to say. Uh, in high school and then I was a wonderful college student and won national prize and but that was because I think I was able to identify with certain things my role as a bad student and when and, and then what happened after that I, I was I felt very disconnected I just didn't follow and then when I was a, if I was a good student, I said, okay, I would ask questions and well, look up things that I didn't know in the textbooks. But then when I was a university professor, I saw that I had lots of students who asked quite difficult things sometimes. And it was, I could see that there were problems and that students often, however, did not take risks and ask difficult things. And uh, people tried basically just to fall back on their notes and see what would happen. They would ask questions sometimes, but not more than that. And so I think what we could contribute here is how we could get that back on a more even keel. I think there have been some fascinating periods that we have been through. We saw, first of all, with the chair of private international law at the university that I was at and for a year, professors were insisting that students should absolutely ask all the questions that they wanted, um, have an open class, and have explanations in classes of the different sorts of notes. And that was a huge success. It was a subject which in the six first methods there were 2,500 questions asked. And some were kind of repetitive, but that didn't matter to us. What we saw was that this brought out the interaction with the bot and these weren't bots that were chatting about sexuality anymore. Normally there weren't questions either to teachers or to parents. They, they sort of felt uncomfortable about certain matters, but here they didn't seem to feel ashamed. They didn't seem to feel barriers. A machine is just a machine. A bot is just a bot. And simply said thanks for asking a question. And so what happened with teachers then, professors with the chair of private international law? They discovered that, in fact, that there was a whole segment of students that were just barely getting by, as we said, in civil law or uh, mercantile law, commercial law, and needed to then have a much clearer understanding of what private law was or might be. And then they, in this way, had a basis for a more personalized form of education. If they had a certain percentage had problems with given subject, the only way to deal with this was for them to repeat certain individual subjects in international law, be it 
civil or commercial or what have you. And then what you had often after the first year was a sort of a scan of the whole subject with all of the questions that came up subject by subject and the explanations you had in different textbooks. And now uh, we see a solution which is being proposed by the professors who work in that part of the university and students who wish to participate in this as well. So they're generating answers to these numerous questions and this is becoming a tool that uses students' own language to have a bot which is able to deal ever more capably with these questions in the right language. And so we basically have a tutor which gets better from year to year, a tutor who is freeing up professors from certain repetitive tasks and allow them to go into more depth and personalized content so as to be better understood. And I think there's also something that we see in terms of the retention figures for students because when a student during a period of study is discouraged in several different subjects, they will become discouraged overall, and this is a subject we've already seen. And when we can manage to personalize things more, have students who are seeing you know, blackboard covered with formulas and, 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 and need explanations, we see, and others don't need explanations so much. And sometimes you see the opposite happening in literature. You see people who are wonderfully capable and creative, but communication by the bot can sometimes help to have a more personalized type of contact and to help certain students. Professors need also to understand better the problems that students have in acquiring knowledge. So basically, this is what I wanted to say. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andres. Well, I think that when we talk about dealing directly with technology, with bots, and everything that might then concern university management, and we see that also helps to free up more physical time for certain professional profiles that exist in our institutions who can then go on to do other forms of necessary work, especially things that were going on during the health emergency, as you were saying earlier. I think that when we look at the development of this type of capacities of skills, especially with these virtual tutors, which help teachers, which help instructors, and represent training for them and help them with their doubts and the problems that they may have and to be able, as you say, to personalize this whole process of learning to a much greater extent. So many thanks for sharing this wonderful experience with us. And now, if it's possible, I would like to go back to Miguel, who I don't know, where are you? Excuse me, sorry. Miguel, we would like, first of all, for you to present your experience to us and then to tell us also well, well, what is going on with you and public policy. Uh, Miguel works with tutoring and artificial intelligence and other digital tools in the Secretary of State for uh, digitalization and artificial intelligence and is working on protocols with the Polytechnic University of Madrid and has been working with the public administration in Spain for more than 10 years with policy design for development and adoption of digitalization measures. And at this point in time, his work is oriented toward uh, high-speed networks and uh, to national and international rollout of these measures, participating in different committees in the European Union, talking about legal uh, standards on consent and consensus, and also dealing in the World Assembly of the ISO. He's been working on the development of implementation of a national strategy for AI in Spain with different activities to give impetus to new technologies, including the use of AI in education. Welcome, Miguel. Many thanks for being with us. And I'd like to know what is the hybrid situation in which we are finding ourselves, which we... Well, the sound is very bad. We're sorry. Hang on. Let's see what we can do with this. I think that we're talking about interacting with chatbots. I don't think there's any difficulty in appearing in hybrid mode in such a situation. 
we have different forms of interaction, and I don't think that's problematic. I would like also to say that I've been listening attentively to the different contributions that have been made up until now from the different contributors. And I think that what is important here is to contextualize things and see what we can add to these matters in the specific context of this meeting. I work in public policy, as we've said, and I think this is something different than what we might see in other contexts. Where I think intelligence, artificial intelligence is, is something horizontal. It has impact on practically all areas of, of being. So the second thing is that when we work together with UNESCO, we've seen that there are different elements that could be of interest for us to comment on. And this document talks about educational management, but it also talks about what can be contributed by students, what orientation can be given within a school system. So I think that at the end, what seems furthest away in 2020, we saw that there were some protests in London. Students were out in the street. And the algorithm which measured how to give grades during the strict lockdown phase had a certain bias and gave better grades to students who lived in areas where there was a higher socioeconomic level and in areas where there was a lower socioeconomic level, they did, the students found themselves without the possibility of getting into the schools of their choice at the end of their secondary school studies. So I think that all of this leads us to think about what's going on with AI and higher education in this case. And I think that this shows clearly and goes well with the whole regulatory framework that we need to roll out, be it in UNESCO with its recommendations for ethics and artificial intelligence, which Spain was vice chair of those proceedings. In the European Union as well, different tools are being developed uh, to look at high risk cases and how this may be done. So along these lines, all of the measures which are being designed need, on the one hand, to look at the impact of the different forms of design, because there needs to be a certain degree of robustness in the design, and we have to be able to exchange results and see where we are with these things. We also need to look at the bias that will impact on people's rights. This is one of the most important aspects. And also to be able to explain for what reason a given AI model makes given decisions. If we can explain this via the algorithm, I think that's uh, a term which is sort of far from some people. But we need to be able to explain convincingly why things happen with transparency, what the protocol is, how it uses data, the other factors that are associated, and so on and so forth. And so this, I think, is what builds the context in which we operate. Because teaching, especially university teaching, I think has this transversal role, which is extremely important. And in the whole area of sustainable development, there was an article, for instance, in Nature, 
in which Ricardo Nuesa and others analyze the impact of AI for the realization of uh, SDGs. And here they have the manifesto on impact. And it's, I think, odd when we see the positive impact that AI can have in certain areas, especially SDG 23. What happens is that what seems reasonable to suggest in terms of AI, because we look at the positive impact it can have, and then what happens in institutions of higher learning where there is this potential for creating knowledge, but we need to maximize those impacts. So in public administrations, we have tried to see how we can support these institutions for higher learning, because I think that's a fundamental role that is being played. In Spain, presently, there is a difficult moment in these institutions. And we can talk about the National Program for Green Algorithms that is looking to follow two separate paths. One is to have a focus for these AI models for responsible energy consumption, for instance, to be more energy efficient. You will have seen these different models involving language and talking about the equivalence of uh, hundreds of flights and what, how they can be offset. And that's one way to use AIs to solve problems. We've made a decision to use these green algorithms to fund decisions that are made in research and support for the environment. And there is, I think, a body of knowledge which is stronger dealing with these two subjects. Then we have the market dynamic as well. We need to see what best practices are with a budget for higher learning institutions and to know what policies then might be served by these algorithm tools, how we can pursue our environmental goals in this context. And we can then have a look at uh, the, the, the competition that there is to optimize these tools in the higher education community. So we have this national program, as I was saying, which is based on artificial intelligence, which has to do with funding and the budget for 200 million euros for university chairs. And it's curious, I think, because what we have seen is that in some of the areas in which these university studies could be funded, could be AI and health, persons' rights, AI and the environment, employment. All of these evolve sustainable development to a greater or lesser extent. And I wanted to touch on this because in higher learning, higher education, there is a possibility to have research to know certain areas better. Then again, research projects need to be funded. And then finally, also to generate training programs in given university areas, which can be extended to society or to the university. And these could be master's programs, or there could be mocks, massive online courses, or other things. And when we look at these programs, and there are several that are part of our strategy in which we see that a major role is meant to be played by AI in higher education. We have to see if we're talking about a very large budget and we're financing, for instance, in 2021, between 10 and 20 million euros per program. And so for a firm, for instance, we would have five SMEs and a research body. And very, very often, we see this, at least in the case of Spain, that uh, People are saying, well, why are these missions being planned? Why are, we, why are we having country missions when we're looking at very serious problems that people think can possibly be solved using these well thought out solutions that may also involve AI? Well, 
I think that to give you an idea of how this works, we've had five missions this year concerning the environment, health, energy, and employment. And to just to give you one example of this, this also has a lot to do with sustainable development. And it's been a lot of investment is being made in this to have a new global agro-food industry which would be carbon neutral, sustainable, and would identify different forms of agricultural production that will respect those goals in a given amount of time. This is the sort of ambition that these missions have. And I think there is enormous potential here for higher education to be involved and to see how these programs could directly contribute to the to this given area and how the area would be impacted and feedback in to the university. Many thanks, Miguel. We, I think, can only agree. We are very, very short on time now. But I would ask you to be patient because with what we just heard from, from Miguel, we will be hearing from, from our next guest and see how the university sector is dealing with AI. And Mahajiva is professor for artificial intelligence in the university, the Euromed University in, Mor in Fez, Morocco, is an engineer, has a master and a PhD in artificial intelligence from the Polytechnic University of Montreal, and is highly specialized in AI. He is also a leader in the data science chair in decision making, and is involved in different projects linked to mobility, agriculture, and smart manufacturing from different university standpoints. In 2021, he was associated with Islamic World Education and Scientific Cultural Organization. And together, they created a chair directed to Women in Science, Artificial Intelligence in the Future. Many thanks for being with us. Explain us a little bit. What have you done since uh, you have been leader in this chair? OK. Um, so first of all, I'm really beyond thrilled to participate to this panel. Thank you, uh, for your ten thank you to the UNESCO for the, the kind invitation. So today, um, I'm given. So the last, the the last speaker gave me finally the perfect transition, because uh, today I'm going to talk more about um, how to enhance the AI ecosystem, uh, the the contribution of the AI ecosystem in Africa through higher education. Um, so the question is very easy: Why the Afri Africans' perspective today? Because 14 people are uh, going to be African within the, the end of the century. And this demographic situation makes things very, can, can push Africa to play an active role in this cutting age research through two key elements. First of all, the young population. So while now the median age in, in Africa is 90, uh, while it's uh, 37 in uh, China and 38 in, Afri in uh, USA. The second key element is the, the, urban, uh, the urbanization rate, the urban population has increased from 19 to 39% within the less than 15 years, 50 years, so, so that's a huge. So those distinct, distinctive characteristics are making Africa um, under the spotlight. And I do believe, because I, 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 I came back to my home country very recently, I've been in North America for several years, and I do deeply believe that in Africa we have this potential to drive a sustainable, fast, and very impactful AI-driven transition. So coming back now to the higher education. So today I didn't want, uh, actually I can't show all what we're doing, uh, but I have chosen two different, I'm uh, sorry, can we come back to the first one? Yeah. I have chosen two different uh, research projects driven by AI for two reasons. The first one uh, is mobility. And this is done, this S finder, that I'm gonna explain in a few minutes, has been developed by undergrad students uh, within, uh, at Automated University of S in the Artificial Intelligence School. 
So, uh, and how? We, uh, th that was during the hackathon. So I've heard a, a, lot, a, spe a lot of speakers talking about innovation in uh, learning tools and how to innovate through uh, teaching and hackathons and those side events uh, and side activities are very crucial to, uh, to leverage innovation in higher education. And as finders, so uh, again, uh, my undergrad students have developed this, this application within the hackathon and then we incubate them, we continue to working with them uh, to empower them and to come up with a prototype. As Finder is based on, um, on uh, computer vision algorithms, so uh, under an area which is covered by a camera, the, the application can easily uh, define um, or uh, detect uh, the, um, the parking uh, spots and then uh, the second element uh, which, uh, which is done by the, um, the application is that it delimits whether it can tell you whether the, the spot is occupied or free and finally you can book upon this application the, the, the spot under a 15 minutes time slot. The second application that I'm going to show is in agriculture Again, to illustrate, and to illustrate the importance to collaborate uh, and to cooperate. So that was a selected, um, I'm sorry, next slide please. Would it be possible? Thanks. So again, this is um, an AI, this is um, a research project which, um, in, which um, implies AI in agriculture to ensure food security. So this is a flagship project uh, that has been selected during the last Congress of ASRIC. Uh, ASRIC is the innovation and research organ uh, within the African Union. So this is a flagship project led by Morocco with the, with the collaboration of uh, Rwanda, Botswana, Egypt, and Nigeria. So the objective is to illustrate through this, um, so the objective of the research project is to come up with a prototype to deliver to the farmers, to empower them to use within, within a sustainable way, water, fertilizers, and the, the most important aspect of this research project is finally that we are going to develop a kind of open data available for all countries, members, states of the African Union, and we're going to share this data, we're going to continue collecting together this data within a very strict uh, protocol of communication, respecting data privacy, and uh, more than the, the technical aspect of the hardware and the software, the objective is really to empower farmers, knowing that 3% of, uh, we, we, we have only 3% of fresh water, and within this fresh water, we're not using, 80% uh, on average is used for agriculture, and we're not using it at the same pace. Developed countries are using 37 in agriculture, while developing countries are using more than uh, 85%. So, uh, we don't have as a humanity, uh, humanity a lot of water, 3% of is salinity water, and still we're not using it efficiently. So definitely this is an area where we can, where AI can contribute. And those domains, I mean, t t today the objective is to say we cannot be good in everything. We cannot start everything. But the most important for me uh, from an African perspective is to target one key, key sectors where key domains, where the African sovereignty bec is becoming crucial nowadays and more than ever. And finally, because as Yuma said, I'm a shareholder of a chair which promotes AI among girls and women, and as pointed by several uh, speakers before, the importance of uh, equity, inclusion within what we are all doing together in AI. So the, um, usually I'm illustrating biases, how AI is reinforcing biases. Um, in, in, uh, within two examples. The first one is uh, if you tap CAO, you're going to have the, the, the emoji man. And if you are uh, using the, um, the tool of uh, translation, the Google Translator tool, so you're going to have uh, Obir, o, Obir Sham, Obir, uh, so it's uh, in a language, Turkish or Pol Polish language, uh, where they have this non gendered pronoun. And then if you turn, if you translate it into French or English, you're going to have uh, she's a nurse and he's a doctor. Now this problem has, was, was fixed by Google, by the way. So uh, I had a, a great, in one slide, I had a great uh, 
print screen of uh, the previous version of Google Translator. So um, happy that the problem is fixed now. So just to illustrate that finally bias are in the data and during the collection of the data, the processing of the data, and then the interpretation of the data. So we have together as, a, as an ecosystem with universities, with the public policy makers, with private sector, public sector to work together. And this is only one type of biases. There are a lot of type of biases, gender, race, uh, psychometric, I think one of the one of the speakers were, were, uh, were presenting, the, the, I think uh, that was the first speaker, Dr. Miao, so the um, psychometric bias. Uh, I think we're gonna end up with a nice video uh, yes. of the chair, uh, just to highlight, uh, because within the, within the video you're gonna see young girls. And the question, I'm, I'm, I've been always asked this question, you're uh, the higher education uh, chair, and we're doing research, applied fundamental research. But still we're working with young girls because we do believe that education starts with the empowering, girl, empowering women and encouraging them to, to go beyond stereotypes, gap salaries and gap in education and all what we are trying to, uh, to alleviate. So the, the thing is that we have to start earlier and then we have to encourage Sorry, girls. Say that again. <laughs> That's a perfect like, like, example, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it wasn't done on purpose, I swear. So uh, the, the, the objective is also to, um, to, to say that we have to start earlier in order, to, have, in order to, to encourage and to promote once we get to higher education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you Dr. Mara. Uh, and finally, we, we are very out of time, but please, Sherry, could you ch uh, share with us a little bit what are you doing from the International um, Center for Higher Education Innovation under the auspice of UNESCO? Sheryl Down, uh, she's Senior Asia Pacific Program Officer. Um, UNESCO IHA aims to meet the local demands of quality in higher education resources and to support Asia and Africa countries to improve quality of higher education and promote educational equity. Sherry, what, what is the role of international organization in promoting AI, for example, into the, the, the sector in the Asia of Africa, please? Uh, thank you, Yuma, and thank you all the panelists and all the contributors for your wonderful speeches. So when I was listening to you... The interpreters apologize, but our time has now been exceeded by a considerable amount and the interpretation will have to stop. Globalization, bias, assumption, and most importantly, an ecosystem were brought up. And I do believe that in order for us to work together, we need to build an ecosystem. So a lot of time, the question, it's not, it should not be what AI could do for higher education, but what, AI, uh, for, but what higher education could do to adapt to AI. It's not a chicken and egg question. It should be, you know, it should be considered at the same time. So what we uh, mostly do is we work with institutions, you know, university leaderships. We also work with t uh, professors. We also wor work with um, private sectors and public sectors, including the government. Together, we try to come up with an ecosystem that really provide a solution for university leaders, professors, what, what we like to call the higher education workforce. Because a lot of time when we say higher uh, teachers, we are simply limited, limited to the, teach, uh, the people who teach. Whereas for the whole ecosystem of higher education, at higher education to work, we need to include multiple stakeholders. So all of you here are important, the key stakeholders for us to work together. So what we do is we work with people like you. Together we come up with a solution to help teachers to gain the capacity that they need in order to, to apply AI in their teaching. We also work with government, especially um, government leaders, for them to realize importance or the necessities of applying AI to the system. And only through all this can we build an ecosystem where we can implement policy at the national level, the institution level, or even at a smaller, like say, a school level, where they could work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry, for being so, so, so for this resume that you have, you have made. Of course, one of the most important things is what we are doing with teachers, no? by skilling and reskilling their competencies. Well, I think we are out of time, absolutely. Uh, I don't know if there is a possibility to make some questions, but at least could be please show the, the video that we will share with all of you 
in order to enhance what the university, the Euromed University of Hesse has been doing, and this chair that they have launched has been doing with the, with the enhanced artificial intelligence competencies in young women. Thank you very much. Thank you, you yes, for yes. having been with us you know, so much, <laughs> more than one hour and a half. And thank you. If you have any questions, you may can send them to us through the app, and we will absolutely answer them in a few days, maybe. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, thank you.